Dear friends in Christ, some of you might remember the crisis of an authority that occurred during 9-11. I know some of you perhaps weren't alive during those days, but it was quite a shocking time for this country. People wondered who was really in charge on that day. Was it George W. Bush, the President of the United States? Or was it Dick Cheney, the Vice President? Or was it the Secret Service? Or was it the military? That very evening, President Bush insisted on flying back to Washington, D.C., so that no matter what the people thought, he could clearly assert, I am in charge here. And in the reading for today, Jesus showed that he was clearly in charge, both by his teaching and by his actions. And no matter what people think, he is still in charge today. The Gospel of John tells us that after performing his first miracle in Cana, Jesus, together with his mother and brothers, moved to Capernaum. It was better located on the shore of the Sea of Galilee and at the intersection of several important trade routes, which made Capernaum an ideal base of operations for his ministry in and around the area of Galilee. It was also the home of James and John and Peter, some of the first disciples. Every Sabbath, Jesus would attend services at a synagogue, which was a very important religious institution in Jesus' day. Originating during the exile, it provided a place where Jews could study the scriptures and worship God. A synagogue could be established in every town where there were at least 10 married Jewish, uh, 10 married Jewish men. Jesus, like Paul, took advantage of that custom and allowed visiting teachers to participate in the worship service by invitation of the synagogue leaders. Remains of that synagogue in Capernaum are still there today. As Jesus began to speak, there was little doubt that he ta taught and acted with authority, that he was in charge. Jesus didn't quote from human authorities, as did the teachers of that day, because his authority was from God. Jesus is the final word. Sadly, some people today don't accept the full authority of God in their lives. They only take into consideration their wants, their needs, their autonomy, their choices. According to our sinful natures, all of us do the same thing. As we read in Isaiah 53, verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. Contrasting with autonomy, St. Paul writes, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. When it comes to life issues, the writer of Psalm, 139, uh, Psalm chapter 139 says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You are not an accident or an afterthought. You're priceless. We can't look past the fact that there are rules and statements in the Bible and our choices can't cancel them out. The Lord said in Matthew chapter 24, verse 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. The Lord is in charge. And that's the authority that Jesus displayed when he spoke in the synagogue. His authority was not only shown by what he said, but in what he did. Our text says, just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus' name was perhaps used in accordance with the occult belief that the precise use of a person's name gave certain control over him. Guess what? It didn't work. Jesus showed his authority by commanding the demon to be quiet and come out of him. Satan is the father of lies, and Jesus didn't want evil forces telling others about him. 
He wanted to control the spread of his popularity, which often brought him into conflict with religious and political authorities. Many scholars today deny the possibility of demon possession. As one of the commentaries I consulted said, perhaps the trouble with us is that we fail to recognize it. This might surprise you, but there is a section for occult practices and demonic affliction in the pastoral care companion that LCMS pastors use. While the rate of demon possession cases might not be as high in our times, Satan and his evil angels are smart enough to adapt themselves. Today we find their power displayed by efforts to undermine scripture and its teachings. We see in it false doctrine, cults, pagan religions, science that rejects scripture, atheism, and efforts to degrade the inherent dignity of human life. In a world full of anti-authoritarianism and conflicting claims to authority, it's a relief to hear Jesus teach and act with true authority. He is the Son of God who has decisively defeated the power of Satan and has given us a new teaching, salvation by God's grace through faith in himself. That verse from Isaiah, chapter 53, verse 6, concludes, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. No matter what unwise choices we might have made in our lives, Jesus has the power to forgive. We hear in 1 John 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Jesus is in charge when he offers the forgiveness of sins in and with the waters of holy baptism in the bread and wine of the Lord's Supper, and in hearing the living word of God. Out of gratitude for what our Lord does for us, therefore, consider supporting those who approach life issues from a biblical perspective, such as LCMS Life Ministries, Lutherans for Life, and Students for Life. We have a chapter here on campus. Consider praying for and supporting the work of the Concordia Center for Bioethics, which is a Christian academic center that applies God's word to issues involving biology and healthcare. As today we consider the authority of Jesus, may we also gladly accept his authority and power to save us. Publicize his authority among those around us. Jesus is in charge and uses us as instruments of his authority to share his life-saving and life-giving message with the world. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We rise for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, bless the work of the Concordia Center for Bioethics and for all the centers and institutes at CUW, that they continue to carry out CUW's mission of helping students develop in mind, body, and spirit for service to Christ in the church and in the world. Dear Lord, be with the faculty, students, and staff during our day off from classes tomorrow. Grant us a productive and restful weekend. Father in heaven, for the war in the Ukraine, the war in the Middle East, and conflicts in many other parts of the world, we pray safety for those in harm's way, healing for the injured, and comfort for all who are suffering from loss. Please bring peace to the world. Almighty God, you know we live in the midst of so many dangers that in our frailty we cannot stand upright. Grant strength and protection to support us in all dangers and carry us through all temptations. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever, and who has taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit 
be and abide with you all. Amen.